Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome, Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries. Welcome all those people who are not in this local church who um, have received from our ministry over the years. Uh, If you have received from our ministry over the years, you know, uh, and sometimes people put in an offering online, there's a comment section. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm so intrigued. I mean, we have one young man gets $5 for the last three, four, five years every week. And all I know is his first name is Derek. Derek, write a little something about you. I mean, I, I respect those kind of people. And, and no offering's too small. You can give the full stature, kingdom life, give to both of them. But in the comment section, write a little bit about, you know, what state you're from, where you live. If you're born again, <laughs> and something like that, because we save all of that, don't we? We, have, we, have, we share all the testimonies that come from around the world, little islands off the coast of Africa that said, I've been teaching your material, blah, 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 blah. I, that's the kind of stuff we want to hear. So, And no offering is too small. Um, but I really would appreciate a comment instead of just an offering with a person's name on it, and you, and you know they're not from the local church. And you don't know what state they're from, where they, you know. Uh, we have we use PayPal. PayPal doesn't give us a name. Uh, I mean, they give us a name, but no address or anything. So put a little something in the comment for us, and we'll keep you in prayer and build relationship. You know, uh, our congregation is very tiny here, but our audience is very broad uh, due to Sid Roth and other exposure like that, and. Uh, Somewhere around five or six hundred views on on today's message will be over a period of time. But I'd like to know some of those people. I'd like to know, especially if you said, "Oh, this is the best one yet, Dennis," but, but I don't know anything about you. Tell us a little something about yourself. Be bold. Brag a little bit. Tell us, "I'm the most mature Christian you'd ever meet." You know, something like that. All right. Whatever. So, Father, we're just thankful for this day and. Yay, it is another day to bless God. All right? Uh, We're going to do a part two. This is for the benefit of those who are going to be encouraged to go online on YouTube. Go to our website, forgive123.com. And on the website, you can view... Enjoy God 1, How to Enjoy God Part 1. This is going to be Part 2, all right? Uh, and what I want to start with is, uh, is from a scriptural point of view, you know, people have a tendency, even preachers, we have a tendency to preach what, what we know the best or what we're good at. And uh, I think there's challenges in the Word of God, though, that need to bring us, if you don't know how to do that, maybe we should be asking God why. But listen to some of this in the Amplified Bible. Blessed, happy, blithesome, joyous, spiritually prosperous, with life joy and satisfaction in God's favor, salvation, regardless regardless of their outward circumstances, are the meek, the mild, the patient, the long-suffering, for they shall inherit the earth. I think this blithesome life joy has fascinated me most of my Christian life because I read a history uh, article that I, I've never been able to shake it. I mention it often that in being fed to the lions, Christians being martyred, the heathens observing them said they have a life joy that's enviable. That uh, wasn't their circumstances, was it? A life joy that's enviable. That life joy is biblical, that life joy is available, but it's really going to be getting to that point to where you're experiencing that life joy. And uh, as we always said, it's not so much that you've got to blow the roof off as much as you've got to let the bottom fall out. And 
and go to your spirit and not, and not, not so much the reasoning mind, but blessed, happy to be envied and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction and God's favor, salvation, regardless of their outward conditions are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. You should read through the Beatitudes in the Amplified Bible. It, it challenges you, and the, the Greek word is makarios, which is a life joy that is enviable. People envied your joy? Have they envied the love that they see in you? Because real Christianity, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's a love message. And if you take that out of it, you've got dead works. You've got a lot of religion and, and things that uh, don't produce. But blessed, fortunate, happy, and spiritually prosperous in the state in which the born-again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and right standing with God, for they shall be completely satisfied. Now, I'm hoping the part two will be the end of this, if I can get that far, but I have a tendency to be very long-winded, and I never get to the end of the message, so that's why we have part one, part two, part three. But uh, we covered this briefly. No, we didn't cover it briefly. We covered it extensively in, in the first message. But there's four ways to enjoy God, and you are called to enjoy God. That's a real thing wasn't just think about him. You were called to enjoy God. Now, how do I do that? Well, there's four, four ways for man to enjoy God. So if you're a note taker, uh, this will be in the first message to some degree, but I believe you need to write it down so that you get some kind of a, a whole awareness of where we're going with this. But the first way is God gave you a spirit. He is called the father of spirits, and he created you with a spirit. So if God created with the spirit, our spirit is the organ for which we receive God. Major on that. Major on that concept. It's not your head. It's the wrong organ. Your spirit will inform your head. But to the degree you're in your head, you're distancing yourself from your spirit. To the degree that you're in the spirit, you're enlightening the, the mind. I found it fascinating when Jennifer uh, did a teaching a long time ago, and I'll mess it up, but she won't, she won't, she don't have the microphone anymore, so I'm pretty safe, but what was it called? Orientation Association. Orientation Association area. area in the brain. God actually even put an area in the brain, I don't want to get you back in your head, but there's an area in your brain that registers self. So when you're selfish, self registers like mm, it's me myself and I it's self-awareness yeah the interesting thing is is that when you get into the presence of God for a born-again believer to to just bask and enjoy spirit to spirit heart to heart that area of self diminishes in the brain self becomes small do you think God would like self to become smaller and him bigger that he might increase, that we might decrease. Do you think that's even possible, that he would like that? Yeah, of course it is. So how do you go about that? Well, first of all, you've got to realize that you were created a spirit being and that everything is, let's, let's uh, you know, stay on the concept throughout this message to keep the main thing the main thing because I'm going to talk on some peripheral areas. But keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is that God made you a spirit being, and you need to learn how to exercise that spirit. And if you don't, practice makes permanent. Practicing the presence of God, we've written books on it. Uh, Brother Lawrence fascinated all the scholars of his day, all the monks, because he practiced the presence of God. But you know what he was doing? Dual awareness. Dual awareness means you don't throw your brains out but you're aware of your spirit at all times. Just like a pregnant woman, eight months pregnant, is aware there's precious cargo down here, but I still have the capacity to do my job at work. I can still think, calculate, and at the same time be aware. You can't chew gum and walk at the same time. You can operate and do awareness, but it takes practice, practice, practice. That's why they call practice the presence of God. That's what Brother Lawrence did. He used to giggle when they would say, okay, men, now we're done with our chores. It's time to go pray. And he, he'd kind of giggle in himself because he'd go, I never stopped. You see, there's special time and there's all the time. And all the time is something that needs to be challenging to the Christians. 
because uh, our spirit is the organ God gave us to receive. I'm going to give you the four for the good note takers that are going to do their homework. God created you with a spirit, number one. Number two, the second way is God became mingled with man. And most of the teaching that's transformed lives is when Jennifer and I traveled to other churches and stuff, it was, a matter of fact, we had a Yaley, a Yaley professor who the light bulb went on for her when, when she saw in one of our books that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. She said, you know what that suggests? It suggests what you're teaching. It's no longer I who love, but God who loves through me. It is no longer I who forgive, but Christ who forgives through me. It's a mingled spirit. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. So that's the second truth that has to be magnified for your relationship to amount to anything other than just business as usual. So God created us, number one, with the Spirit. Number two, it was the incarnation is really what it is. Jesus was incarnated and God became man. That's how much he loved us, that he wanted that relationship with us. He wanted that relationship with us so much so that he humbled himself to become man and God at the same time to show us really not only how much he loved us and demonstrated his wanting to be in relation with us, but he also wanted us to see how clearly that, that we can be trans transformed and express him. When you love somebody and you know you are being loved, you want to reciprocate. But true reciprocation comes only by receiving. You can't give something you don't have and you can't have something you're not even open to. And so God's saying this. The second thing is Jesus was in, incarnated. He was God joined with humanity. Uh, Jennifer's got a good booklet on the humanity of Jesus. Because don't forget, before the miracle started, before his ministry started, he walked as a man. But he showed mankind how to live what it was like to be humanly Jesus. <laughs> so there's more of a lesson in that than just the signs and wonders. All the signs and wonders just point to his, uh, his godliness. But his life spoke, to, like he said to Philip, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Expression is the highest level of communication, not words, I've listened to people with, you know, word salad, and it didn't really amount to anything. It had no life in it. We're looking for the life joy that is enviable when someone wants what you've got. And God's got it, and he wants to give it. Let's be partakers of the divine nature. Well, partaking of the divine nature means that we absorb it, we marinate in it, and it becomes us. Now, the third step is the provision that God made for us spiritual beings, children of God, the Father of spirits. See, we're going to keep staying on the focus that you are a spiritual being. Don't lose sight of that and, and figure things out. That doesn't work. The clay has no right to tell the potter, what are you doing? How are you doing? What are you making? If you want to know the purpose of a thing, don't ask the thing. <laughs> ask the person who created it. Right? Now, this third step was Jesus was crucified on the cross. And this is even what this ministry has seen so much success for in changing and transformed lives. And that was his blood was shed to remove sin. And this was our professor from Yale. That was her revelation. <gasps> what you're suggesting is if it's no longer I who live, it's no longer I who forgive. Exactly. It's the mingled spirit, the person, the new creation that forgives. You can forgive in your head all day long and nothing happened. 
You can be sincere in your head all day long and nothing happen. But it's the mingled spirit that the blood cleansed you. And what, what is this church known for? When we travel, the people go, eh, that's a jump for, um, uh, that's that forgiveness thing. <laughs> that forgiveness thing has changed people's lives because they were doing it wrong. They weren't doing it from their spirit. They're doing it from their head, and they were sorry, and they were sincere, and they were still troubled. The only way you can tell that there was a supernatural provision here, what Jesus gave and shed his blood for, was that you could walk in the light as he is in the light. You'd have fellowship one with another, and the blood would continually cleanse you from sin. Now, how do you walk in that relationship? You walk a forgiveness lifestyle. But how, how does God see that, that beautiful blood-removing the cleansing, only God can forgive sin, and yet Scripture says you must forgive, or your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. So that means the forgiveness is going to have to be, if only God can forgive sin, then you're, you and God are going to have to do it together. It has to be the spiritual man. It has to be the new creation reality that does the forgiving. Your head can't forgive no matter how sincere you are. It doesn't work. And how do I know if the supernatural took place? Simple. Peace. When you got born again, you made peace with God. There was a transaction that took place in your spirit. It's the same way with forgiveness. I, I've been weary by even preachers that have said this. We probably lose friends on Facebook, which is just fine with me, who are teaching something that is dumb as, well, just change the subject and the forgiveness. And, eventually, or just forgive and eventually the pain will go away. That is utter nonsense. You didn't get saved and then everything went away eventually. You got born again. You said, I receive you, Jesus. Cleanse me of my sin. And you had peace with God. And you had, and here's the key word. We're going we're gonna to beat this word to death. You had the substance you know, don't we like to say, we like to say faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things. Faith is substance, but substance implies you substantiate it. If you can't substantiate it, it's just, it's just wishing and hoping. It's just head knowledge. Substantiation is required. If you received forgiveness and you release forgiveness, it should change as a transaction to peace. Things are back in harmony. None of this garbage of oh, forgive and live with the pain. Jesus took our pain and our sorrow. As a matter of fact, there's three verses that, um, uh, that Bill Morford intrigued me with. Uh, out of all the research that he did in the development of his Bible, the One New Man Bible, he says, you know what, Dennis? He said, he didn't really get do anything with it. We've been teaching it ever since. He says there's like 30-some double I am's in the Bible. I am, I am. Truly, truly, verily, verily. You know, we even see that. But I am, I am. He said, but there's three I am, I am's that are double that are different than all the other I am's. The other I am's speak quite clearly that he's talking about this is something that I do. But there, I think it's like uh, a knee, a knee. Is that right? Jennifer's shaking her head, so I got it right. I know he, I know he. There's three I, that emphasize the emphasis. Wow, I'd say God must have felt that was pretty important if he emphasized what was already emphasized by doubling. He doubled it and then added an exclamation point on top of it. And nobody else can do this but me, say a God. Here's the three double I am's. I am, I am your savior and no one else can deliver you. So much for many ways to God, huh? That wash that garbage out right off the bat. I am, I am your Savior, and there's no one else that can do it but me. The second I am. I am, I am the one who blots out your transgressions, and nobody else can do that but me. Wow. And then lastly, I am, I am your comforter. Everything else is a false comfort. I alone am the true comforter. Now, I could see why... To me, that's the heart of a loving father telling his children, I'm revealing the, the primary main thing about me to you. I I'm, I'm, I'm want to deliver you and save you. 
I, I want to wash you and cleanse you so that the vessel is, is acceptable. I don't want you to stay in evil. I want you to change and be transformed. And lastly, I know that in this world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've removed its ability to harm you. He didn't say I removed all tribulation. I've removed its ability to harm you. That's good news, isn't it? That means that he can comfort us even in times of affliction. But we've got to go to him for that and not major on the affliction, but major on the person who's with me. Prayer is not just talking. Brother Lawrence really showed. Prayer is being with someone. Uh, I was the, the talker in the family, and Jennifer wasn't, but I'll tell you what, when I spend time with her, whether we're talking or we're not, I'm with someone. And I'm aware, aware, aware. That's what you're supposed to be doing spiritually. Aware, aware, aware. Being aware that there is a spirit in you that is sensitive to what's going on and you do not have to throw your brains out. It's dual awareness. You can be aware in your gut. Do you hear Jason's testimony uh, about uh, uh, a car honking behind him and, and, and he felt this supernatural peace even though you don't like to make anybody upset behind you, he felt the supernatural peace to not take his foot off the brake. It kind of caught him by surprise. He, then he took his foot off the brake, but he saw, in the meantime, someone just ran a red light, a double-wide mobile home, ran the red light for whatever reason. He'd have been crushed. But the supernatural peace of God guarded his heart and his mind. And it transcend. what is it? And let the peace of God that surpasses your understanding. Tell me, what does that mean? Just a plain old English. You exalt that understanding when in reality there's nothing to exalt there. Satan exalted, I will exalt my throne. I will, I will. If there's five I wills, and guess what? God had the last word and said, you shall be brought down, you shall. <laughs> Not a very pleasant, pleasant thing to the pride of the I. Exalting the self. Now, did we ever get to the fourth point? Well, the third point has two parts, really. And this kind of ties in with what uh, Jennifer taught about the brain. Uh, the orientation. Orientation, association. Uh, O-A-S. Orientation, association. Area. area. It's an area in the brain that when self gets diminished... God is actually then become more in your thoughts. But it starts from your spirit, goes up. It doesn't go, oh, I got to get that. Didn't you hear that in church a lot? I got to get that down into my spirit. No, your spirit needs to contact God and his word through prayer and meditation and musing and mingling with his spirit, and it will inform your pea brain. Now, that third step was he forgives your sin, but at the same time, there was the death of the cross. So it's not just the blood that cleanses you from sin, but the death of a cross. For You know what the cross was for? Yourself. <laughs> Your self-life. That tendency inside to be an independent self. That I, I got a better idea than God. Here's what I think. Ew. Remember we, in the last message we talked about the that my, my spiritual father said, Dennis, for all those people, because I was getting frustrated, all these people tell me, I feel led to do this, and I feel led to do that. And I'm going, uh, by discernment, they are like off the deep end. And he says, you get a big ball of lead, and you put it up by your pulpit, and you call them forward, and you tell them they can feel lead anytime they want to. But it's true. Most of the time when people say they feel lead, not most of the time, but... Not in this church, maybe other places, but not there. When they feel led, it's usually preference. It's what you like or what you don't like. Mm -hmm. Then you say, you tack on, I feel led. You get spiritual. Mm -hmm. But we're going to get into that because there's a way to know the difference. There's a way to know how to, uh, the message translation does a beautiful job of that. I'm not, I'm not past the first page, so we're in trouble today. Um, <laughs> The message translation says to steep, you know, like a teapot, tea bag. Well, on Jennifer and I chose to take the word steep out and put marinate. I like marinate. 
soak, absorb, marinate, get the flavor. All right, well, it's marinate in, in uh, Matthew 6.33 in the message translation, this is, and that's a paraphrase, marinate, steep in God reality. What's reality? Truth. Truth and reality means reality, though it's not just truths, mental facts. Steep, marinate in God reality. God initiative. Oh, how do you, how do I marinate in God initiative? I can't be waiting around to make decisions all the time. I've got, it, I've got things to do, places to go, people to see. I can't be marinating on God initiative. But yet, promptings of the Spirit are available to every believer if you could quiet your noisy mind, will, and emotions, like three bad kids. Take those three bad kids and say, quiet down now, let's see what God has to say about this. It only takes a second. You can, you can wait for promptings of the Lord and that's God initiative. So you marinate in God initiative. And when the prompting comes, your timing will be right. Now, uh, Jason's example of the, uh, the, the double Y that ran the red light, that, wasn't, that was a question of those who practice the presence of God, the peace of God will override your understanding and make himself known to whosoever loves him. He will guard their heart and their mind and, and sovereignly step in in cases like that. But the beauty of it is, is that God's saying at the same time he, 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 Jesus was crucified, the incarnation, he not only cleansed us from the sin through the blood, but that he brought us to the place to where, where self, self can be dealt with or the old creation. Remember we used the, we used the little acronym OFF. Open. Whether you know it or not, when you got born again, you opened your heart. You received forgiveness. O, F. This is how you put off the old man. Receive forgiveness. There was a transaction. Fruit. Peace. Some felt love. Some felt joy. There's only one fruit of the Spirit. It's the love of God, but it can manifest in peace, joy, patience, kindness. But there was evidence substance that was substantiated. That's two words you need to write down because people throw that word faith around like it's a rabbit's foot or something. You know, whenever they don't know how to do something, they just say, well, I'll just do it by faith, which usually is in the flesh. Faith has substance. Substance needs to be substantiated. And the only organ that can substantiate it is your spirit. You can't figure it out. You're not that smart. Lucifer tried that. Didn't work. Now, if we are told we must take up our cross and follow him, that's for self. And we really, the more time we spend in God, isn't it interesting that even in your brain, self becomes a, think more highly of others than yourself? That, that is, that's possible, but it's possible in God. Otherwise, it's a false humility. Now, the fourth element is he rose from the dead and gave us life. He rose from the dead and brought man into God. Resurrection brought man into God. And by his ascension, Jesus brought man fully into the ascension life of, or what we would call life in the spirit. Walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Uh, <clears throat> now, here's an example that we're probably all real familiar with, but sometimes it, you, you remember the example when you don't remember the whole teaching. All right? uh, if we were to put sugar, grape juice, and we added it to a glass of water, picture us now. You're still, you're still water, basically, except there's an additional ingredient. You didn't stop being water, but you began to no longer be just a glass of water. It now contains water plus other rich ingredients. This is what that mingled life is supposed to be like, for you drawing on that divine nature, partaking. So whoever drinks from that glass receives all the rich elements. On the day of Pentecost, boy, they didn't just get water. 
They got drink that included many rich elements. God even gave gifts. He gave some, that was his gifts to the body. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, he gave gifts. He ascended on high and gave gifts. There was a lot in that water that was coming on the day of Pentecost. There was a lot of good nutrients in there, a lot of attributes and characteristics that we need to go after and recognize that in you, you have a uniqueness. One of the worst things you can do is waste your life away never discovering the uniqueness that's in, in your life. But that uniqueness will be expressed as Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, you're going to have to go to your spirit. That's still going to be the proper organ in order to exercise. That's why we say exercise your spirit. To exercise your spirit, you will be tapping into all of those gifts and talents that are in there. In my first church, when I'd have young people say, Pastor, what's my gift? What's my gift? I said, just start loving people in the church, and I'll tell you what your gift is. Because people will be motivated to love in different ways. And when you can see it, you can start to see how if God got a hold of their life more fully or completely, just how beautiful that expression of that individual would be and how needful it is in the body. We need one another. There's nobody that says, well, I don't, have, I don't have any gifts, I don't have anything. You've got love, and you can give that away. Now, whether we realize it or not, this is the beauty of the new creation, being born again. Whether we realize or not, all those ingredients came into us. Uh-oh, you've got ingredients of quality from Jesus in you that you don't even know about. I think it's time that you start discovering what those ingredients are that's inside of you that came at that time. It was more than just, more than just uh, the cleansing of sin and uh, the termination of self. There was a generation, there was a renewal, there was a, 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 an enlivening. Zoe, I always like that word in the Greek, Zoe. Zoe, that's the life of God. That's the God kind of life, not biological life. Zoe, like the life of God. There, therein you get the life joy that's enviable. No. All those ingredients entered into us. When a person receives the spirit, the function of all the elements contained in the spirit, God's mingling with man, man's mingling with God, the cleansing of sin, the termination of self, the germination of the new creation are activated. Oh boy, a lot of good stuff happened in there. We need to be more than just thankful. We need to discover those good things that are inside of us. All right. So, now, the four steps. Oh, Lord, I want to cover four peripheral steps and four, so I will probably rush this a little bit. And Jennifer told me, no, she went like this. That means don't rush it. All right, maybe there will be a part three. But part one, that's exercising our spirit. All right, uh, when I catch a ball, a baseball, I exercise my fist. When I speak, I exercise my voice. When I look at people, I exercise my eyes. When people listen to me, they're exercising their ears. In order for us to contact God and enjoy Him, we have to exercise our spirit. What part of this do we not understand? You exercise your head and your ears. And it's, and it's funny because it's like we, we, we should come and pray according to the feeling deep within our being. Well, baby boomers were taught ignore feelings. Now we've got Gen Zs are all about feelings and they're, all, well, they're, they're wild all over the place. That's a good thing though because I can, I, someone that's all over the place, I can reel them in and show them, here's how you take toxic emotions and present them to Jesus and to, let them change into the fruit of the Spirit, the God emotions. Now we can talk about the God emotions and not, be, not have everybody go, eh, he said the word emotions. Do you know that most of the revivals historically were stopped by head people? There was head people and heart people and most of the revivals were quenched because of head people. But anyway, neither that, that's not going to happen now. We got Gen Z coming up, and man, they're all about feelings. We just got to say, we got to get them to the right feelings. We got to get them to the God emotions, the fruit of the Spirit. 
all right and oh all the stuff i've seen on facebook oh help me jesus when i feel rejected i just redirect all my energies behavior modification oh that works real well uh, silliness silliness the emotions don't die they get buried alive and the only one that can handle toxic emotions is jesus he will take your pain and you take your sorrow but you need to learn how to do it and until you learn how to give toxic emotions to jesus and see the transformation the transaction take place to where it changes to supernatural peace you're not doing it you're just suppressing for a later manifestation what gets suppressed will get expressed later there have been people that have spent even a lot of their christian life uh, but no highs and no lows just kind of trying to get through that's not the way to live i want to experience the life joy that's enviable i don't want to be numb that's not an accomplishment I mean, it might keep you from hurting yourself and doing worse things to other people, but at the same time, I don't want to live like that. I want the life joy that comes from God. I want the real thing. So, Father, we're just praying right now that in exercising our spirit, we have to kind of forget about our thoughts and be so concerned with what we're going to say and simply turn and pray according to the feeling deep within. That's not that hard. He didn't go anywhere. We have these powerful God tools. That's the message translation. We have these powerful God tools, and they're ready, and they're at hand. How could they be ready, and where are they? They're in you, these God tools. And what do these God tools want to do? And I love the way the message uh, breaks it down. We, we know it as bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and we know it as the weapons of our warfare, not carnal, but mighty through God, pulling down strongholds. All that sounds nice and warfare-y, but at the same time, in the message, it just says, these God tools want to bring every loose thought, what kind of thought? Runaway thought, impulse, will, and emotion, captive. That means brought under the authority of the Spirit. God doesn't want to annihilate your emotions. He wants them to submit to his lordship. Now, the feeling deep within us is the feeling of the Spirit. And my generation, and, and including we, I talked about this with, with, uh, with uh, Brian Simmons, who wrote the Passion Translation. He said, I was trained under the best evangelical leaders in the country, and they all told me to ignore feelings. But that was the teaching of the day. But right now, we're in a different day. And God is opening that arena that unless you deal with these things, they're going to control you. They'll, they'll take on a life of their own. And they'll lead you around by the nose. I don't know about you, but I don't like that concept. I want Jesus to be ruling and reigning, guarding my heart and my mind. So when we pray according to the feelings, we're exercising our spirit in prayer. We should simply turn and pray according to the feeling deep within our body. The feeling deep within us is the feeling of the Spirit. To exercise our spirit, when we come to God, we should pray according to the feeling deep within our being. I probably got some baby boomers out there going, he's using that word feeling again. <laughs> Which would tell me you're probably manifesting. We can teach you what to do with that manifestation. Manifestation is good if you properly reply it apply it redemptively, we're going to teach you how to take it to Jesus. You don't have to live out of control. You can pray with your mind. How should, what should I pray for? How should I pray? Should I pray for my parents, my finances, or my job? You think that sounds like Christians in general, though? Well, guess what? That's wrong. Should I pray for my parents, my finances, or my job? A, a wife may wonder about praying for her husband's business or praying that her children be great. That is not exercising your spirit. That is exercising your mind. Those sound like good questions, and they can be good questions, but you're going to the wrong source. You're asking the thing. Don't ask the thing. Go to the source. Prayer should be involving God's initiative. Remember? His prompting. His going, oh, 
go this way. I'll tell you what, all the miracles that I've seen praying for people, I felt the prompting of praying for those people, not by a prayer request as much as it was a prompting of the Spirit at times when I least expected it. I have more confidence in those. Not that you totally throw away the other, but begin to appreciate divine initiative. Marinate in divine initiative. Learn what is a prompting of the Spirit and what is just you getting tired of waiting so you do the right thing or the wrong. Some people would rather do the wrong thing than wait. <laughs> Bill Morford said that, he said, my wife's got better discernment. He was a scholar, but my wife's got better discernment than me. And he used to say, and what we had to do is practice red light, green light, yellow light. And if she'd say, honey, don't do that. She got a red light. Well, he had a green light. He would think, well, you know, why not? Well, this, this is a good idea. And she'd go, no, I'll do that. So he says, in marriage, he found out that red light, green light, yellow light, maybe we ought to wait until we both get the same color light. Let's go to yellow right now for a while and get neutral. Red, yellow does not mean hurry up or a red light's coming. Yeah, yellow means there's a wait. Let's just wait. Don't make a radical decision at this point in time. Let the peace of God precede any decision. That's what you should be practicing this month under the peace challenge. Don't make a decision until you've got peace because if you're all fearful, fretting, and everything, it's going to be a bad Bad timing, even if it's a good decision. And that can be terrible. Now, here's the part that I find it so interesting. It's not exercising your spirit, but you're exercising your mind. We could exercise our mind at school or on the job, but if it's wrong to exercise our mind in, in the way when we pray. Does that make sense? You gotta use your mind at work. You got I'm not talking about throwing the brains out, although I am talking about that even at work. It's be wonderful to learn dual awareness mm -hmm. and, and and recognize the precious cargo that's down here while you're using your mind. And you can do it. You can chew gum and walk at the same time. And I know that's a profound mystery, but you can do it. Now, the more we exercise our minds, uh, the more we think, the more God goes away. <laughs> Not really. In reality, he doesn't disappear. He's, he's still there. You're the one that goes away. <laughs> and we go away by using the wrong organ. You're going to start loving your spirit as an organ. You're going to start playing a good tune from your spirit. And the key word is substance and substantiation. If you're a note taker, I'd write those two words down. Because if it's real and it's God, it's substance. Faith is substance. Faith is not nothing. Faith is substance, but that means that your organ of your spirit should substantiate it. Your head can't substantiate it. The spirit substantiates it. You have, even new believers will say, I know that I know. Why do they say that twice? Because they're actually substantiating that I know in my spirit and my head agrees. I know that I know. My knower down here in my spirit and my head recognizes it. Now, Hebrews 11.1 1 is the one we use all the time. Faith is substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's evidence! That means it's not a nothing. Faith is a substance, the evidence of things not seen. The evidence, proof, the title deed, some say. Now, we cannot use our eyes to hear or our ears to see colors. If we try to see a red cup with our ears and try to identify the color in this way, the red will disappear. Why? Because you're using the wrong organ. I love that part. Tease yourself a little bit and say, am I using the right organ? Because I can't hear what he's saying. Well, are you using your eyes? That's the wrong organ. You don't want to use your ears. All right, all right. Okay, enough of that. If we try to hear the voice, but you're trying to listen with your eyes, 
You're not going to hear it either, are you? Okay, I said enough of that last time. In the same way, we cannot contact God with our mind. God can illuminate our mind, but our mind cannot contact God. God can contact our mind. Gee, that sounds like initiative needs to come from God. Gee, that means, sounds like I need to exercise that organ and make better contact and inquire. Behold, inquire, spend time, practice his presence. Wow, that's kind of an upside down life. That would be called life in the spirit. And guess what? There's a side effect. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Oh, I've had trouble with lust of the flesh. Oh, but you won't struggle with it. Because remember in the sequence of, of, of learning to enjoy God, that there's forgiveness for the blood, and there's self, there's the cross for self. God is being exalted, and you're walking in the spirit. God is spirit, and therefore he is substance. All right. <clears throat> now we know that those four elements uh, that we've covered, <laughs> I was going to cover them again, but we won't do that. But as long as you've got those four elements down, written down as notes, and you see, because we need to understand in, as Christians, this is the important part. I've got 10 minutes to cover this part. There's central truth and there's peripheral truth. Majoring on the peripheral doesn't work. Even the good things that are on the periphery. Let me explain. There's four, the four matters. Uh, we already saw that life in the spirit is a resurrection life on the fourth of the first four principles. Let me go over that again. God created, gave you a spirit. The second thing is it's mingled together as a new creation. You're one spirit with the Lord. The third is Jesus, Jesus was crucified for the blood of redemption and for self, the cross for self. And the fourth element was to walk in the spirit. Resurrection life. If that life that is in you, raised, that raised Jesus from the dead is in you, he shall give life to your death-doomed mortal body. Okay? Those are the four principles. Here's where you could, we're going to say, I, I think we have to say this over and over again. Keep the main thing the main thing. Keep the main, say that after me. Keep the main thing the main thing. Those first four principles have to be the main thing. Now I'm going to talk about four peripheral areas that are significantly important, but they are not the main thing. Uh-oh. So there is central truth and there's peripheral truth. Now the first category and the peripheral truth is suffering and trials. It's a peripheral matter because if you did the first four, consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials that the testing of your faith produces something. Huh. Be of good cheer, for there in this world there is tribulation. But I've overcome the world. And in this world of tribulation, I have removed this ability to harm you. You want that consolation? You have to maintain the first priorities. Otherwise, it's just you, 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 your head will get in the way and you'll come up with all kinds of weird concepts of pain and suffering. Remember, if you want to know the purpose of a thing, don't ask the thing. Ask the creator of the thing, in our case, God. So the, the first category that's peripheral, and it's very important to learn. P, uh, Christians in the lion's den, Christians in the arena being fed, Christians like Paul being in jail writing the book of Philippians, the book of joy. That's a supernatural transaction. He wasn't flippant, and he didn't try to work it up. It was a reality out of the, maintaining the first four priorities. 
Those first four priorities are the main thing. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Then when it comes to suffering, you're, you're actually balanced. You're in God. And you're walking in a realm that says, yes, there is tribulation in this world, but I'm in an overcoming position of heart. The second peripheral matter. Now, I'm not saying these matters are not important. What am I saying? Keep the main thing, the main thing, or these peripheral areas will be all screwed up. And people emphasize the peripheral areas. I've watched people. You, you can be evangelism. Is that a good thing? You can be evangelism and mission-centered and not Christ-centered. That's not an accomplishment. You can be off-center. The center has to be him. Maintain the things that are, need to be maintained as central. Now, the second area is related to morality. Well, we've got a booklet on the Didache, what the first century church taught to Gentiles who were clueless. They had no Jewish background. But the 12 apostles taught them before there was a New Testament with the teaching of the apostles or the Didache. And one of the first things they taught them was there's two roads to God. There's two roads. There's the road of life and the road of death. And great is the chasm between the two. Choose, if you would get started like that, then they went into morality. Don't put your babies out in the cold just because it was a girl. I know your culture approves of that, but God doesn't. Those are God's children, not yours. They belong to him, not to you. But he didn't get into the morality until they, had, they were on the right track. Again, we have to keep the main thing the main thing. Now, the third, and, and you know, the work of cleansing is necessary, and we've got the tools. If you really study the main thing, you would deal, know how to deal with self, and you'd know how to walk in a forgiveness lifestyle. You'd, where the rubber meets the road, you'd be walking in the love message, then deal with suffering, then deal with uh, morality, because you're coming from a place of victory, to victory. The third element is guidance for human living. It's a peripheral matter, but there's secrets for human living. Uh, Jason and Gwen have a remarkable uh, ministry in this area of how should human beings live on planet Earth? What are human relationships like? How do I deal with my children? How do I deal with my husband or wife? How do I... How do I relate to inner people? As important as that is, and as significant as that is, without, without the original foundation, it's a peripheral area, and you'll probably do it wrong. How, how are you going to really have a loving relationship, husband and wife, when Christ loved, wants you to love as he loved the church? And you're not in that relationship deep enough with him. So you're going to try to do it. In most cases, you try to change the other person. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> and you know what? They did a survey on that. It's scary. What, what, what was that, Jennifer? We read seventh grade? Seventh, ninth graders? Ninth graders said, girls, how many of you think when you get married, you're going to change that man? <laughs> Whoa! Men! Ninth graders. How many of you, when you get married, are going to let your wife change you? Wait, are you people crazy or what? What we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> but that will come in time. Mission impossible sounds like, right? But, however, these are all peripheral matters. How do I relate to our spouse? How do we handle money? Uh, how do we relate to other Christians? If you did the main thing, those questions would be flowing in the anointing and the spirit, and you wouldn't even have, some of those questions would just be automatic. It's funny how that when you, uh, when God taught me how to stay in his presence and sit still for, as a hyperactive kid, I thought the first step was I touch him, and a feeling of the spirit touching. Then touch, I learned to sit still a little longer, and that touch became an embrace. Whoa! Once it's an embrace, that means you've quieted your noisy flesh. But once it's been an embrace, there's a satisfaction. 
And I'm going, I've never, I did drugs in my day, but I never had anything felt this good. This is satisfaction. And then the satisfaction was kind of tricky. You know what it did to me? After I found that there's a satisfaction in God that I didn't even know existed, I wanted to reciprocate. Doesn't that sound like God? And I loved him with his love. With his satisfaction, I offered it back to God. And you know what that did? That provided what scripture would call uh, uh, abounding, overflowing love. Overflowing love. You know what that did? That led me to a greater understanding of the heart of the Father. You know what that did? The heart of the Father is to bring many sons unto glory, and that's why you're getting this kind of teaching, and you're not getting a bunch of head stuff. Because God's calling forth sons and daughters to glory. He wants them to know that Christ in you is the hope of glory. And you can't skip that step for higher learning, higher education. Higher education, you, you, need, you don't need deeper truths. You need a deeper nature change. That should be pursued first. The last category, the fourth category that's peripheral, although we're going to keep the main thing the main thing. And when I use the word peripheral, that does not mean these are not important. I, I know you're hearing what I'm saying there. I'm saying is that they're peripheral in the sense that you've got to do the main thing and the main thing for the peripheral to have real meaning and life expression. The fourth category is religious zeal. This category of peripheral matters in the Bible is a zeal for religion, a zeal to serve God, to be dedicated to him, to love him, and to be faithful to him. These are not bad things, but you cannot do these in the flesh. Try doing this in the flesh, you will frustrate yourself. You will burn out. They're all good, but they are religious concepts. They are peripheral concepts. They are not the central point of the Bible. What's the central point of the Bible? The first four. These peripheral four will blossom under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the initiative of the Holy Spirit. The Bible contains these four peripheral categories of things. The central matter concerns God becoming our life. The peripheral matters deal with many things, solutions to suffering, conduct, moral conduct. Some may have no consciousness of God becoming their life, and they will try to do those other things. We hold... The main truth, I'm going to close with one scripture. <clears throat> the challenge, I believe, as we continue to walk in the peace challenge, Acts 17, 28. Keep the main thing the main thing. In him we live and move and have our being. In him we live and move and have our being. And let, as a church, I know this church won't. When, uh, when they did that survey, John Bevere did that survey, the average Christian cannot give a definition of grace beyond unmerited favor. And that's real good for salvation. But favor is the personal presence of Jesus empowering you, enabling you to be and to do all that he called you to be and all he called you to do. It's empowerment. It's not just, oh, I like grace, I need grace, I need grace. I'm not going to try, I'm not going to apply myself, but I'm just believing for grace. You want unmerited favor? It got you saved. Now you're to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you to will and to perform. So our battle cry is going to be, keep the main thing the main thing. These four Peripheral elements are significantly important, but they're not central. Can we hear an amen? Amen, amen. amen, amen. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, 
That's forgive123.com.